line and you pull it apart and rotate it at the same time. So you have the two corners, my two fists and my two elbows make the tetrahedron, make the corners of the tetrahedron. This way and this way, here to here. And so if you trace the fact that these opposite edges are rotating against each other and follow that rotation and link them up, you get this propeller shape. That's where it comes from. Now, how do we get from here to here? Well, what you have to, to realize is that both of these systems of forms expand at the same time. The tetrahedron becomes these other platonic solids, regular and semi-regular solids, and the vortex forms unfurl with it. It's sort of like a flower unfurling. If you take a tetrahedron, and you just extend its corners a little bit, bringing it up into a higher dimensional state. And you keep doing that. Here I've extended the corners, and I put little edges on them. And then this orange tetrahedron becomes very small. The Kabbalah says the arms of the universe extend to infinity, so we make the diagonal directions very long. There's 12 of them. You end up with this form. This is what I'm doing up here. Do you believe that that's a tetrahedron? And as that unfurls, it becomes this form. You see how it fits? The triangular faces are the triangles. These bifurcated edges become the square faces. And so the tetrahedron literally grows into the cube octahedron. The cube octahedron, as Fuller points out, jitterbugs. <clears throat> By itself, it comes up from the octahedron to the icosahedron. And this is a kind of orticular motion in itself. So as the platonic solids unfurl, the flame unfurls. And then if we put the alphabet on the form that the first verse draws, and this is going to get interesting now. We've got a, a text that folds itself up into an object. It's written in an alphabet. The alphabet has decorations on it. We put the alphabet on the form that the first verse makes in alphabetical order, just following it around in alphabetical order, these little decorations line up in the corners. There is one decoration on one corner, there are two on the next, three on the third, and then there's zero opposite three on the remaining corner. They specify a tetrahedral coordinate system. One, two, three, and a spin axis. It tells you how to hold the figure. You need to know how to hold it if you're going to make letters from it. It's taught that these decorations somehow contain the secret of redeeming the alphabet, and no one knows what they're there for. And I don't know of any other arrangement that shows what their meaning might be. And the thing is, they look just like the corners of the tetrahedron actually looks. Not only that, but if there really were little spheres on these corner points, then the little decorations would look precisely as they're drawn. Three little points with a sphere on each, on each corner. And so the decorations really do redeem the alphabet by creating the coordinate system that tells you how you can make the alphabet. And so here we have a text that folds itself up into a form that casts shadows which are the letters that the text is written in. I would call that self-referential. I would call that self-embedded. And self-referential, self-awareness, is what distinguishes us from the other animals. It's self-aware creatures that we're attempting to communicate with. When the Bible says that we are made in the image of God, it doesn't mean, except for a few religious sects, which I hope I'm not insulting, it doesn't mean that we look like God. Most people don't think God looks like me. You think me, right? You all agree to that, don't you? Okay. Maybe Johnny Carson, maybe, maybe George Burns, but, but not me. No, the image is that we are self-aware, and we presume God is self-aware. We presume folks living in outer space are self-aware. Some of the higher animals are self-aware. Coco the gorilla certainly seems to be self-aware. Some of the elephants and, and dolphins and, and gorillas are likely to be self-aware. 
We would like to build an artificial intelligence like R2-D2 or C-3PO that would be self-aware. Um, this is a universal language for self-aware creatures because self-awareness is also the study of oneself. If you have a society of self-aware creatures, they will, by definition, study themselves. And the people who study themselves in society are called philosophers. And the philosophers will study philosophers who study philosophers who study philosophers. And that infinite recursive chain of philosophers who study philosophers um, is the same chain as the chain of acorns and oak trees, acorns and oak trees going on forever. And so whether you're looking at the self-propagating quality of living systems or the self-aware quality of the creatures who are looking at the self-propagating quality of living <laughs> systems, um, you get the same form, a self-organizing form. Um, what does it organize itself into? Well, let's take a couple of these guys and let them self-organize by pairing them off. You pair them off, you get what look like little animal heads. And there are four of them, if I don't drop them. And what do they represent? Now, this is where we're going to get interesting. Oh, by the way, um, I was giving this talk in, in Jerusalem a couple of years ago, actually an earlier version of it, and a rabbi got up and was quite agitated. He said, um, do you mean to tell me that Rabbi Nachmanides in the 11th century in Portugal had your model in front of him when he made up to the alphabet he wrote in? He said, well, as a matter of fact, there is one object that one can expect rabbis to have. So I held up the little ram's horn. <laughs> You know, I mean, <laughs> what can you say? Um, let's go a little further. Um, if you look up the word Apollo in your dictionary, you'll find it means a polon. A means not, and polon is cognate to our word full. P, L, and P, and F are the same. Full meaning many. A polon meaning not many, meaning one, a monad, a unit. Their one God. Apollo is said to be the archer of the sun. Well, the center point, be it here or here, is called Shemesh, the sun god in Babylonian. Shamesh, the lighting candle in Hebrew, the candle that lights the menorah. If one were to also check Robert Graves, one would find that Apollo also meant, I'm looking for a model, which is evading my face at the moment, um, also means apple. If one slices Apollo, cognate to apple. If one slices through the middle of an apple, one finds a star of seeds in the middle, surrounded by the peeled apple skin. This is the star and crescent of Islam. This is the sign of the covenant, the bow in the sky. The sky is the star, the bow is around it. Apollo is called the archer of the sun. And he's an apple. Well, here's an apple. If I spin it, maybe you can see that this is peeled off of an apple. And there's the star of seeds in the middle. And from the stem to the flower end of the apple, there is a spin symmetry axis down the middle of the apple, which is also the form of a two torus. A fruit is the fruition of the embryonic process, after all. And if one looks down the middle of the apple, the spin axis goes through the sun. This is an apple. Apollo is the archer of the sun. If you look through any of these figures down the middle, you'll also see a heart shape that the arrow pierces. So we have an apple with a heart in the middle pierced by an arrow or a sword. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> no one knows where the heart symbol comes from, by the way. Now, if you think this is fanciful, it's a little book by a mathematician from, I think, Cambridge or Oxford or some such place, called Field of Form, where he talks about generating the shape of all kinds of fruit, all kinds of buds, and more buds, and also the heart muscle in seven wound layers 
all in an 